So as we're studying the uh, Gospel of John, we're keeping our eyes, of course, on the three strands, you know, those three uh, narratives, if you wish, themes that John interweaves into one single narrative. And we said the first was Jesus demonstrating His divinity, He's the God-man. And the other two uh, that John demonstrates are people, how people react to Him, some people react with faith, other people react to this knowledge, to this testimony, if you wish. Uh, they react with disbelief and you just keep seeing that same pattern over and over again in the book. In the passage that we're going to cover today, John the Apostle records the last witness of faith in Jesus by John the Baptist, and then we're going to have some information on the various understandings of baptism that people had during that time. All right, in chapter three, verse 21, uh, that was the last bit of conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. We don't hear from Nicodemus again until later on when he'll uh, defend Jesus in principle, if you wish, before the Sanhedrin, and then he will assist uh, Joseph of Arimathea in uh, burying uh, Jesus after his death on the cross. So let's pick up verse 22, shall we? That's where we're at. And it says, um, after these things, Jesus and His disciples came into the land of Judea, and there He was spending time with them and baptizing. And so John uh, picks up the story with Jesus heading into Judea in order to preach and baptize along with His disciples, leaving the city behind. He's been to the city, he moves away from the city. A Little bit later in uh, chapter four, verse two, um, the apostle John clarifies that Jesus himself did not do the actual baptizing, but rather his disciples are the ones that did the baptizing. He did the preaching, they did the baptizing uh, of those who responded. Interesting, the, the, the pattern that is set early. People hear the gospel, the good news, whatever, and their response of faith always includes baptism to this day. So it, it continues in the same, uh, in the same thing. Um, now the Bible mentions baptism quite often. I'd like to pause here and look at this issue just a little more closely so we can understand the various references to baptism that John is going to make as we go on because he talks about baptism in different ways. So first of all, the word baptism, the word itself, is not an English word but rather an anglicized version of a Greek word and the Greek word is baptizo, baptizo. This word came from a, um, a root word which meant to make wet or to overwhelm. It was also used to describe something which was covered or immersed in water. For example, a ship that was being overwhelmed by water and sinking, if you wish. In the New Testament, it was mainly used to describe the religious rite of water purification where the individual was covered or immersed in water indicating a spiritual purification, a spiritual cleansing of some kind. Because of its um, special nature, when it came to translating the word, it was simply kept in its Greek form and given an English suffix or ending. In other words, a transliteration, not a translation. If they were to translate the word, it would, it would have gone from baptizo in the Greek, translated into the English meaning to uh, to overwhelm or to plunge, uh, so on and so forth, but they did a transliteration. They simply anglicized the Greek word and it became baptize. Um, as far as the practice in those days, there were many types of baptism in the Jewish religious experience. So the people in those days were familiar with the many references made about baptism. For example, the uh, washing of the priests, uh, John talks about that in John chapter 2, verse 6. Priests practiced water purification of objects. They baptized the cups. You know, that, that term, proselytes to Judaism, had to be circumcised first, then baptized, and then they would offer sacrifice in order to enter into the, the Jewish faith. So there was baptism, if you wish, the, the idea of water purification from a Jewish perspective that had been practiced in that way. Um, 
Also, there is John the Baptist's baptism, John chapter 3, verse 11, immersion in water for forgiveness of sins and preparation for the kingdom to come. It was a, an expression of faith that um, this time was at hand. If, if you believe John, when John said the Messiah is coming, the time of the kingdom, that's a, if you believe that, then your response of faith was to come forward and, and be baptized uh, for the remission of your sins, but also to prepare yourself for the coming of that kingdom. Uh, there's also the baptism of suffering that's mentioned, Mark chapter 10, verse 38. Here the word refers to the idea of being overwhelmed or covered with suffering, not water. So Jesus is said to be immersed in suffering, His baptism of suffering. You know, when He said to the apostles, uh, to John as a matter of fact, uh, uh, can you, you know, have the baptism that I'm going to have? Are you going to have that? He wasn't talking about water baptism, he was talking about the baptism of suffering. Can you do that, he said. Another reference is the baptism of fire, Matthew 3.11, 1 Corinthians 3.13. This was a reference to testing and judgment. Now in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that the work of the saved will be tested by fire. In other words, the work that we do, the ministry that we do, the service that we perform, it'll be tested, it'll be judged by fire, if you wish. For the unsaved, the fire of judgment is punishment and suffering. And so when, when they talk about the baptism of fire, they're talking about judgment, all right, usually. A, Either a, a thing, a service, a ministry is being judged or an individual is being judged. That's a baptism of fire. Uh, there's also the baptism with or in the Holy Spirit, John chapter 1 verse 33. I want to mention to you that there's a common saying out there in the religious world and that is, uh, have, you, uh, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You hear that all the time, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting is if you read through the New Testament very carefully and you look at every single reference to baptism, you will never find the term baptism of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't exist. Now there's baptism in the Holy Spirit, there's baptism with the Holy Spirit, but baptism of the Holy Spirit, in other words, the baptism that the Holy Spirit administers, that term doesn't exist because the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the one that the Holy Spirit commands is what? Yeah, baptism in water, Acts 2.38. Just a little aside there. So baptism with or in the Holy Spirit, this is a reference to Jesus giving the Spirit to others. This is also a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophet. Peter quotes the prophet Joel in saying that when the Messiah would come, this, prof, this promise would be fulfilled, that the Spirit would be given to everybody. And a lot of times you know, we think, you know, we're, we're looking at Acts 2.38 where Paul is, uh, excuse me, Paul, Peter is preaching his first sermon and he comes to the climax verse you know, where they say, men and brethren, what should we do? And he says, repent and, and, and let it, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We always emphasize forgiveness of sins. But when the Jews heard him say that, the thing they really keyed in, keyed in on was the second part of that. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because the thing that they looked forward to in the Old Testament was that everybody would have the Spirit. Because in the Old Testament, who had the Spirit? Well, the judges had the Spirit, the prophets, you know, Isaiah, the Spirit was upon me. You know, the kings had the spirit, individuals had the spirit just for a, a short time to do a great work or to lead the people or to speak in God's name, but only a few people had the spirit. And so the great promise to the nation was when the Messiah comes, everybody's going to have the spirit, the young and the old and the male and the female and the slave and the king, everybody's going to have the spirit. So when Peter said this, forgiveness of sins, they were familiar with that idea because John the Baptist had been preaching that at the beginning and Jesus and his apostles had also been preaching the same idea, baptism for the remission of sins, but now Peter adds, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow, this was the fulfillment of the promise that the prophets had made 
for a very long time. So how exactly did Jesus fulfill this baptism with the Holy Spirit, this covering, this immersing of His disciples with the Holy Spirit? Well, He did it in a couple of ways, actually. <clears throat> First of all, during the time before His coming, in other words, in the Old Testament, only a few, as I said, were baptized or immersed with the Holy Spirit. Patriarchs, leaders, prophets, all of them were empowered to minister to God's people in special ways, but as I said before, this was rare. This did not happen very often. Then, during the time of Jesus' ministry, uh, Jesus Himself was filled with the Holy Spirit. When? Well, at His baptism. You notice any miracles He did before His baptism? No. He began producing the miracles after. Why? Because He received the Holy Spirit, the full measure of it. And by His presence, He blessed others with manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So His miracles showed the Spirit's power and His teachings revealed the Spirit's word. So to answer the question, how did Jesus immerse the people with the Spirit during His ministry? Well, He did miracles to prove who He was. He taught them the word of God. He filled them up with the word of God for several years. And then for us, after His resurrection, Jesus gave the Holy Spirit in three different ways. First, He gave the Holy Spirit to His apostles and they gave it to other disciples to empower them to do miracles and thereby confirm that their preaching was true. Someone, you know, the apostle comes along and he says, all right, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, raised from the dead. And people are listening, you know, they don't have the word or anything, they just got Peter or you know, someone else. And so they say, well, why should we believe you? And Peter said, well, see this person here who has been blind from birth? Healed. Now do you believe me? You know, so they needed the power, the empowering of the Spirit to do miracles, not to show off or make money or anything like that. They needed that in order to confirm that what they were saying was indeed from God. Um, Another way, He gave to everyone who believed in Him and obeyed the gospel in repentance and baptism, to these He gave the Holy Spirit to dwell within them. Now I want you to notice something very important here. There's a difference between indwelling and empowering. Indwelling, everybody who believes, repents, and is baptized, everybody gets the indwelling of the Holy Spirit but not everyone received the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The empowering enabled individuals, first of all the apostles, to do miracles, speak in tongues, prophesy, heal, do things like that. And at times the apostles would confer that power to other individuals in the church by the laying on of their hands. And those individuals would then be empowered to do those miracles and so on and so forth. But in the first century, the only way that someone could receive that empowering was through the imposition of hands of the apostles. There is one exception, of course, Cornelius in Acts uh, chapter 9, 10, uh, where Cornelius and his household begin speaking in tongues. Uh, but Peter at one point says, you know, why should we you know, prevent these from, uh, from being baptized as they received the, the Spirit in the same way we did? W what way was that? Well, he fell on them. The Spirit fell on them. But other than that exception, the only other way people received the empowerment in the first century was through the imposition of hands. And once the apostles died, the method to transfer the power, the empowering, also died, um, died with them. And so, um, uh, uh, so the second way, of course, was the empowering of individuals. Also, um, uh, he, after His resurrection, the Lord poured forth the Holy Spirit on the entire world by providing the Word in the Bible, and it's available uh, to every, everyone. And so when we speak of the baptism with, or the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we're speaking of Jesus giving the Spirit to others in these different ways during these different time periods. Uh, some to empower to do miracles in the first century, the indwelling of the Spirit to all believers when they respond to the gospel, and uh, the immersion of the world with the Word of God. Three ways that the Spirit is uh, given. 
All right, one other, one other uh, baptism reference, and that is the baptism uh, of Jesus Himself, Mark 16, 16. Of all the baptisms mentioned, this is the one that we still do, that we must do today, and that is the baptism of Jesus. It was authorized by Him, you know, in Matthew 28, He said, you know, make disciples of all the, uh, make disciples, how? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was also required by everyone who believed in His resurrection. Uh, Peter making the very first sermon. When they, it's so clear uh, you know, how people miss it and fight it. I mean, Peter gets up, makes the very first sermon, right? We're talking about the resurrection, and the people actually say, what, what should we do? <laughs> they don't say, what should we think? They say, what should we do? And if there was ever an opportunity for an apostle to say something about what a person should do to respond to God, Acts chapter two is it. So what does Peter say? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why change that? There's, there, you know, there's no reason to, to change that. We're not allowed to change it. So Jesus' baptism eliminates and supersedes all others. In other words, when Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 5, there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, what he means is there's only one, you know, I mentioned several, right? Suffering, fire, all that kind of thing. There's only one baptism left to practice and that's the baptism in water for the remission of sins. So Jesus' baptism eliminates and supersedes all others. For example, no need for Jewish purification rites. The blood of Christ purifies and we come into contact with that blood at baptism, Romans 6, 3. Uh, John's baptism, well, it's been fulfilled. He says, you know, be baptized, the, the kingdom is coming. Well, the kingdom's here. The king has come. Um, the baptism of suffering has been accomplished. Who accomplished it? Well, Christ. He's gone, he's, he's accomplished the baptism of suffering. He suffered and died on the, on the cross. The baptism of fire is an expression of judgment and not a command to be obeyed. Nobody, nobody you know, has to respond to the baptism of fire. It's just an expression talking about judgment. And then the baptism with the Holy Spirit has been given to the apostles and made available to everyone in the world through the gospel. If someone says, I want to have the Spirit. What do I say to him? Well, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and so on and so forth. That's how you get it. So the only baptism left to be preached, practiced, is the baptism commanded by Jesus, practiced by the apostles, recorded in the word, baptism in water by immersion for the forgiveness of sins and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so in our brief review, we've looked at the various meanings of baptism that both Jesus and Christians had at that time. And I think for you know, this audience right here, I haven't said anything that's very, very, very new. But if someone is reading John and just looking at those terms, I wanted to make sure we could kind of put the proper terms in the proper context because the Bible does mention baptism many times and I want us to understand. Uh, we've also looked at Jesus' commands concerning uh, baptism, the one that He wants His disciples to receive, the manner of it, what occurs spiritually, that's what I do. When I baptize someone, you ever wonder, you say, you know, someone that wants to be baptized and uh, you know, you, your, your friend, your wife, your cousin, your child or something, and you come to me and I would say, well, I need to talk to them first. You ever wonder what I talk to them about? I, just, I ask them what, one question. What's going to happen here? Aside from you going down in the water, what's going to happen here? And based on that, tells me if they, you know, they're ready or not. When they say, well, my sins are going to be forgiven. Okay, or, well, I, I want the Holy Spirit. Well, great, uh, I want to obey Jesus. That's a good reason, you know what I'm saying? I want to find out what are they thinking when they're going down in that water. And I want to give them as many 
you know, as many reasons that the Bible gives, because there are a lot of reasons to, be, to obey for forgiveness of sins, to put on Christ, to receive the Spirit, to be buried with Christ, to have the, the new life, you know, to go to heaven. So you can give a lot of biblical reasons for baptism, and usually I want to find out how many of those reasons the individual has, and maybe add a couple of more, so that their experience will be fulfilling uh, and, um, and encouraging. Okay, so we can close this little subfile here and get back to our main passage where John says that Jesus and His disciples were preaching and baptizing in the area where John the Baptist and His disciples were during that time. Now, not to confuse you, but which baptism was Jesus preaching at this time? Well, He was preaching the baptism of John the Baptist to prepare for the coming, obviously, because He had not yet completed His mission. So John and Jesus preaching kind of the same thing here. Only after Jesus' death and resurrection did He command to baptize in His name for the reception of the Holy Spirit. He, that's not what He was preaching while John was still alive. Um, okay, so let's go to, uh, back to the text. Verse 23 says the following. It says, uh, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, uh, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples uh, with a Jew about purification. See what I'm saying? Purification there. Uh, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So if you know and saw how dry and rocky most of the land is in that area, you would realize how special a place with a lot of water is for someone whose ministry is baptizing people. We also note that there begins to be some confusion among John the Baptist's disciples. Note that it was a Jew who was the center of the dispute. And the term Jew, when it's used here, uh, is used to describe Jesus' enemies. It wasn't a cultural reference. The Jews were His enemies, those in positions of power that were against Him. Many times you know, He would refer, uh, the apostles would refer to them as, as the Jews. Okay? Uh, John's disciples note that a comment was made as to which baptism was superior. Who do you think started this debate about well, whose baptism is better? Well, the Jew. <laughs> Some guy walked in and said, well, you know, why should we have your baptism? This Jesus over here, he's baptizing too. You know, which one should we get? Which one is better? You know, stir it up. Stir it up. So they go to John to settle the matter. Now we can read of their disappointment at seeing their numbers starting to grow smaller. They were with John, but had they really understood his message? You know, a lot of times immature disciples confuse faithfulness with party spirit. Not the same thing. You know, fan loyalty, that's not faith. Note again the two strands of belief. Those who were coming to be baptized, those are, one, those are the ones who believe. And disbelief, the Jew. The Jew who came and caused the dispute. Both narratives kind of match together in the same story. So John is going to answer his disciples' question and in doing so, he's going to give his final witness of faith. So let's read verse 27 and 28. He says, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from, a, uh, from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. So first he makes a general statement saying that uh, everything that you have, including ministry, comes from God. We often say, you know, well, you know, my house and God gave me my house and my kids, you know, but he's giving you your job, your health, your skills, you know, it all comes from God. And so uh, the point is this should make us pay attention and be good stewards and not be proud because if all comes from him, well, it can all be taken away too. You know, we, we rejoice when, it, when we get stuff, but then when we lose stuff, we sometimes get angry or disappointed. Why? It was given to us, now it's taken it away. So John, this is John's attitude. I've been given a ministry, and now that ministry is diminishing. Why should I be upset? Why should I be jealous? I, I didn't do anything to get the ministry, it was given to me. 
And so now it's, 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 you know, it's going away from me. So John makes a specific statement concerning his own unique role. He repeats and confirms what his role was, to be a forerunner, one who would prepare the way for Jesus. His ministry was the culmination of all the prophecy and history of the Jewish nation contained in the Old Testament. You know, a pretty, uh, pretty lofty ministry. John knew this and he carried out the task given to him by God. So let's keep reading verse 29 and 30. It says, he who, has, uh, he who um, has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but, John says, I must decrease. So he's satisfied that he has both understood correctly and accomplished his ministry. I've done what I was told to do, he said. Isn't that wonderful when you fulfill what you're supposed to do? Younger people uh, you know, that need counseling many times, one of their main questions is, what am I going to do with my life? I don't know what to do. What should I study? What, you know, what course should I take? Should I? They, they're not sure. It's, it's a great burden to them. And then there's great joy when they finally figure out, oh, I was meant to do this. And that happens sometimes several times in our lives, not just when we're 18 or 19 going to college. It happens you know, when we're in our 30s. It happens again sometimes when we reach kind of middle age. You know, we, we're kind of looking at the past. We know we don't have as many options for the future. You know, so we go through this crisis several times in our lives. So John, you know, he's been through the crisis. I know what my mission is and even you know, now it's coming to an end. How, you know, how can I be upset? This is what I was born to do and I'm doing it. So um, he's satisfied that he's understood and uh, accomplished his ministry and he compares it to the role of the best man at a wedding who's very busy before the big day but once the wedding day arrives his role diminishes. He's the best man. He's not, he's not the groom. So we see John's humble attitude in accepting his decreasing role and Jesus' you know, constantly increasing in primary role. Now humility is not you know, speaking softly or having no opinion. Some people say, oh, he's very, he's very humble. He never says anything. He has no opinion. That's not, that's not humble. That may be something. I don't know what. But that's not necessarily being humble. Um, Humility is allowing God's will to be done in your life instead of your own. That's humility. And usually allowing God's will to be done in your life with the minimum of whining. <laughs> you know. I remember in an office I worked in once, there was a huge, you know, like a button that you, you, you put you know, like for a elections or stuff like a big, big button and it was a circle with a line through it and it whining. And it was like, a, it was like a, an office you know, motto. No whining in this. Office. We can do whatever else, but we don't want anybody to be whiners. Well, that's what humility is. No whining. So we also note his joy at seeing God's will fulfilled in Jesus' coming. So John testifies that what is happening he is decreasing and Jesus is increasing was in God's plan and he was happy that it was, that it was happening. And so he makes a witness concerning, uh, concerning Jesus. John is still talking to his disciples. He ends his comments with a final testimony about the Lord. And in this he will answer three questions about Jesus that haven't been asked but they kind of hang there in the air as his ministry decreases and as the Lord's ministry increases. First of all, why he must decrease and Jesus must increase. He says, he who comes from above is above all and he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. So the reason will become quite evident John the Baptist, he's from below. He's human, he's like all men. And Jesus is from above, he's the God-man. He's the greatest of all. So it's only natural that this progression take place, that the ordinary man decreases and the God-man increases. Verse 32, he says, what, has, what he has seen and heard, 
Of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. And so the next question is, how will the people react to Jesus? And John says, they're not going to accept him. Jesus will speak God's truth, but men, for the most part, will not believe. And considering Jesus' teaching, His pure life, His miracles, His resurrection, disbelieving is the greatest sin. You know, we often think murder or adultery or whatever, you know, embezzlement, cheating. We see the, you know, when we ever talk about the big sins, you know, I've even said it in, a, in sermons, you know, uh, uh, you know, the big sins like murder, and you know, those are the big sins, but you know, the really big sin is disbelief because that's the sin that will condemn people. Because we're all sinners, you know, one way or another, we, we sin morally and ethically, we sin, we sin, we sin. But disbelieving is the sin that kills the soul. So it's quite a, a judgment that John is, is making here. John's point is that condemnation will be deserved See, uh, seeing that such a great witness, you know, it's as if God is saying, is there something more I could have done to convince you? That a man is murdered in front of your very eyes and buried and then comes back to life? Never mind the miracles, the teaching, the insight, just that. Is there any other thing I could have shown you that could have convinced you even more? And then the third question, <clears throat> did everybody disbelieve? Is that, is that going to happen? In verse 33, he says, He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So John the Baptist concludes by saying that not everybody disbelieved, not everybody. Those who did believe in Jesus' words, however, were literally saying that God really is. If you believe in Jesus, you're saying there is a God. We've seen Him. Now the word true in the Greek here means manifest or, or uh, 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 unconcealed. And they know this about God from Jesus Christ because He comes and speaks from God. The only way to acknowledge God is to acknowledge Jesus Christ. To deny Christ is to deny God. And it doesn't matter how fancy your worship is and how much your zeal is or how many people follow your idea. John is saying, if you don't acknowledge Christ, then you, you're, you're not going to acknowledge God in any other, in any other way. So one's eternal destiny was decided by how one responded to, to Christ. Heavy, heavy words. So John the Baptist believed this about Christ and the witness he is making to his disciples is done, so they'll believe and follow Jesus. He's sending them over to Jesus. They're saying, you know, why, why, you know, why, why is our ministry decreasing? And he explains why, and then the coup de grace, he says, so therefore, you know, don't be afraid to leave me. This is, the way, this is the way that it's supposed to be. And then we get the epilogue, chapter four. It says, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, and here's the, uh, the little note here, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went, ag went, uh, went away again into Galilee. And so we know that verse, you know, we know that the verses, you know, the chapters and verses, they were not in the original manuscripts. Chapters and verses were added many, many years later, and some of them are kind of awkward divisions. They kind of just stop. Chapters four, one to three is really a bridge between what happened in Judea with John's disciples and then Jesus leaving the area to return to his home area in the north around, uh, around Galilee. Note that what moves him to change locations is the news that the Pharisees have taken a greater interest in him as his ministry grows. That's not a good thing. They were to become his fiercest critics and enemies. 
but he doesn't want a confrontation, not right away, so he leaves for the friendlier and more quiet surroundings of his home in Galilee. Okay, so this ends a section where we observe many descriptions of people who believe, for example, John the Baptist and many of his disciples, as well as those who disbelieve. Some of John's disciples, of course, the Jew that he talks about who created the discourse and the Pharisees. Now in our next lesson, uh, we're going to get back to seeing Jesus through His teaching and miracles. Uh, we're going to get a, a fresh you know, presentation of Jesus, the God-man, as we continue to work our way line by line, verse by verse, through the great gospel of John. All right, those, that's the lesson for today. Thank you for your attention.